Looking for Sally, Episode 3, The Point of No Return. You remember I'm going to the group meeting today, right? You remember it's a busy day at the workshop today, right? Don't do this to me, Jay. You take Charlie to her French class. I'll go pick her up, just like we said. James is daydreaming as he drives along Interstate 70. Images of a happier past, where everyone is smiling, laughing, like they were actually a family. The thought leaves a bitter taste in his mouth. And as Charlie continues to scribble feverishly in her notebook, as if her pen can exorcise whatever is haunting them onto the paper, James can't help but wonder, where did it all go wrong? I still don't understand why we had to leave so early. I told you, Charlie. Yep. Traffic jams. Charlie glances at the clothes left to dry on the back seats. They're still damp. Thank you for the laundry, I guess. A shadow passes in the rear view mirror, like a hawk, circling its prey, dipping in and out of vision. James shakes off the notion and focuses back on his daydream. But as the details of the past start to flesh out, James is starting to realize that his daydream isn't so dreamy after all. Sweetie, I'm sorry. Mom forgot. I came as fast as I could. She's upset. Can't you tell? Now she's mad at me. Again. I'm sorry. Sally, I feel like I'm raising this kid on my own since... Since what? It was an accident. A fucking accident, Jay. It cost me my career. I'm doing my best with Charlie. I know, honey. I'm tired. Shit. What's wrong? I forgot to fill up the tank. Can you check where's the nearest gas station, Charlie? Please? Why don't you ask Siri? Who? Never mind. (sighs) 20 miles. Or you can try the industrial area. Next exit in two miles. Heads or tails? I'd better stop. In the middle of nowhere? You gotta be kidding me. I saw a warehouse a little further on. You wait here. Lock yourself in. Are you... Uh, fucking serious? Charlie never gets to finish her question. Her father has already gotten out of the car and is walking away down the long, flat stretch of road with only yellowing fields of grass to be seen for miles. Sorry if I scared you. I ran out of gas a few miles from here and was wondering if you could help me out. I'm sorry. I can't help you, man. I don't need much, just enough to get to the station. Yeah, just keep on walking. Look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take some of this gas here and go back to my daughter who's waiting in the car, alone. Look, man, I told you. James can physically feel it. The rage building up inside of him. The heat rising in his neck. The snarl hidden in his chest. The twitch of his fingers rearing to break something. It takes everything inside of him to not start a fight. But the man 
doesn't see the monster before him and stupidly swings at James. As a man's soft, flabby body and Dorito's covered hands grazes the sleeve of his shirt, James is violently repulsed. He wants to crush the man, stomp on him like a cockroach, rid the world of his pestilence. Without warning, the hydraulic press grinds to life. James almost smirks when he hears the sound of the shrill metal whining, begging to be fed. Fuck you, asshole. Maybe you will like to have today's menu. Sally doesn't know if she should open the door. Her mind is still foggy, and she's not sure if the voice is coming from inside her own head or not. Or worse still, the being behind the door is a demon that's been haunting her dreams. But something about the voice sounded real, friendly, caring. Thank you. Is there anything else I can do for you, madame? The motel attendant looks worryingly over Sally's shoulder and at the room. Empty bottles and dirty clothes litter the floor. The half-eaten food with flies buzzing around the open containers it's a mess. Embarrassed, Sally snatches the menu out of the attendant's hands and hurries to close the door. Hide the mess. Hide herself. No, I, I have all I need. Thank you. Well, we are here for you. Sally's mind freezes. That phrase, those words, that intonation. I'm here for you. Suddenly, Sally's transported back two weeks ago to the heavy atmosphere of the living room with the thick blackout curtains, not a sliver of daylight to be seen, and the acrid smell of the peculiar black tea wafting through the room. Slowly, the memories begin to emerge. The almost hypnotic sound of a kettle whistling mingled with the sound of a woman's soft and calming voice. Karen's voice. Karen's house. Honey, you're not safe in your own home anymore. Don't say this. Jay is a good man. You could join the community. At least for a while. Take a break. I don't know, Karen. Think about it. We're here to help you. Sally still had that bitter taste of the tea on her tongue. It wasn't like any kind of tea she ever had before. Piquant and biting. And its consistency had a thick, congealed quality, like almost curdled milk or blood. Sally remembered the feeling of confusion after she drank that inky black tea. Perhaps it was another trick in her sick mind. All at once, Sally craved the safety of her husband's protective arms. But even that felt wrong. Truth was, she didn't feel safe with anyone. What have you done to me? To us? I told you to stay inside. You've been sick again. I always get sick when I'm left alone in the cold in the middle of nowhere. 
It's okay, Charlie, now. I'm here. It won't happen again. If you say so. Are you okay? Are we still looking for Mom? Of course we are. What's going on, sweetie? I just want to go home. Honey, I know you're tired. I am too. I miss your mother. I want to find her. Come on. Think about your Aunt Gracie's blueberry pie <laughs> and that stupid dog. <laughs> See? Let's go. Hello? Hello. My name is Eddie. I got something important to tell you about a missing person. The name of that person? She gave me a fake name, but I recognize her from your site. Nothing I gave her a lift. Sally Anderson. Wait a minute. Hey, Sherman. Yes, Susie. What's up? There's a guy here saying he saw that woman you're looking for. Just transfer the call to my station. Hey, Clay. I think you should see this. Can it wait? I got a guy on the phone who has a lead on Sally Anderson. Well, this is about her. We just finished checking out their house. Look what we found in the master bedroom. What? Where? Under the bed with a bunch of pins. Pins? Jeez. We have no leads for days and then all of a sudden it's chaos. Get that blood sample analyzed and find the husband too. This just doesn't feel right. Are you sure it's a good idea, Dad? Camping? Doesn't look bad, actually. Who doesn't love a cabin in the woods? Oh, rocking chairs! See? The water reflecting off of Wren Lake sparkles in the early November sunshine. James opens the cabin door and sets the bags down inside. He pulls the curtains open to let in the light, hoping some of that light can shine into himself to get rid of the shadows and hopefully the beast. James lingers before the window. He stares absently at a young couple setting up a tent by the water's edge. Then he hears it somewhere in the back of his mind. James knows that his attempt at light has failed. At least we get a warm meal tonight. Yep, you'll have to fish it first. Morons. You could help me gut the fish instead of gossiping. Yuck. What about my french fries? <laughs> Pathetic. Okay, you win. Go set the table, I'll be right there. Charlie closes the door behind her. The screams of laughter from the other campers make her feel uneasy. She's felt this way before. Anxious, then impossibly angry. That's how it happened last time. The marks have almost disappeared now, but the rage has left unseen scars. Charlie grabs a remote and tries to turn on the hulking TV set in an attempt to drown out that feeling. Shit. I want a refund. Charlie. What the heck? But this time, she heard him clearly. There was no denying it now. Charlie was staring at the screen when she heard the sound, and it wasn't coming from the reporter's lips. The air feels icy cold around her. Charlie clutches a cross-shaped pendant around her neck. She wants to scream, but she can't. She's paralyzed. Charlie. 
Go away. Leave me alone. You could at least have brought back your rod. Did I say something wrong? Here's to you, honey. <laughs> the distant sound of laughter tapers off as the effects of alcohol begin to settle in James's mind. He feels drowsy, sluggish, intoxicated. He feels as if she's watching him sink into the darkness. Hey, don't look at me like this. It wasn't me. There's a light breeze lifting the leaves, and a moonbeam shines on the red Mustang parked under the tree. But there's something else swirling in the wind, hidden amongst the shadows of the tree branches is another darker, more solid shadow. James takes another swig of his bourbon and tries to convince himself that it's just another drunken hallucination, that the beast will stop breaching him and playing with his mind. Fuck you. <laughs> They are close now, less than 10 feet away. James glances down the path to the lake and takes another swig. But it's no use. It doesn't quell his sense of unease. The leaves fly and dance around the car. The beast is dancing, calling him to join in. Suddenly, James finds himself standing at the trunk of his car. His hand barely grazes the steel when the trunk opens, almost by itself. James lifts the bottom liner and pulls out misery. The blade gleams in the moonlight. She's ready to slice, gut, and devour. She's hungry. Linda, come on, don't do this. You know I can't see a thing at night, right? <laughs> you will have to find me if you want to ever. The young woman ducks behind the tree, but doesn't notice that someone is already there, hidden around the bend of the trunk. Without warning, a hand clamps over her mouth. Before she can scream, a burning sensation crosses her throat, cutting her windpipe. The last thing she feels is being dragged by her hair and her calves being skinned by the branches. Come on, at least give me a hint. Hey! What the? No! Heavy black boots smash his face in before he even catches a glimpse of his attacker's face. James keeps kicking until the man stops moving. The beast is hungry tonight. The two bodies leave a trail of blood down to the lake. He loads them onto a one-person kayak. The tiny boat rocks unevenly as James pushes it into the water. I'm telling you, he's acting weird. More than the usual? I mean, it's Jay we're talking about. 
Distant. Not like him. Damn, I hate this machine. Blood was made to stay inside us, not get out of our veins for a roller coaster ride. <laughs> you shouldn't overthink this, honey. Jay is a reliable guy. I bet he just had a good time hanging out with his buddy. I hope you're right. Damn, I forgot to call the surgeon. Go ahead. I'll keep him warm. What the hell? James wakes with a gasp. <gasps> the day has not yet dawned, and he's back in the driver's seat of his Mustang. Fuck. Could it have been just a dream? But a light clicks on in the cabin, and James sees the dried blood on his hands. Charlie's silhouette passes the curtain window. She's coming outside, out where she'll catch her father, red-handed. Shit, Charlie. Panicking, James rushes out of the car. Charlie steps onto the wooden porch, still wet from the morning dew. But her gait is unsteady, and James immediately understands what is going on. Fuck, not now. James catches his sleepwalking daughter just before she falls off the four feet tall porch. Gently, he leads her back inside and into bed. Charlie's eyes are glazed, absent. She can't see her father's blood covered hands and boots, the shreds of skin and hair still clinging to the black leather. As he closes the door to Charlie's room, James gets a reality check. He needs to clean up, cover his tracks, and leave as soon as day breaks. You almost got caught this time, Jay. James wants to pretend that he can't hear the voice, but it's too late now. The whispers of the beast are already inside of him. And James feels drained, too weak to stand up to whatever this entity is. No way. I don't believe you. You've been sleepwalking for a while. That's freaking cool. No, it's not cool. Could have turned out real bad. Next time I'm locking the door. What were you doing outside in the cold anyway? Drunk again, hmm? Was this an investigation or what? Charlie notices her father's drawn features. Sometimes, she wishes everything would just stop. The road, the nightmares. But she knows he won't rest until he finds Sally. Did you know there's a town called Kevka? Nope, and I have no idea what that means. You're the one who took the French glasses, Charlie. If we're good, we're in Pittsburgh in 18 hours. James's cell phone lights up with a strange glow. Charlie grabs it. It's a message from Mike. But what it says in capital letters makes Charlie's heart sink. 
Jay, it's Mike. Don't come back home. They found blood in your room, and they're looking for you. Without thinking, Charlie deletes the message and puts the phone back. What does it say? Just a scam. Did she not clean up as well as she had thought? She had bleached and burned all the evidence. Would the cops come looking for her? Paranoia rocks her mind like a boat caught in a squall. Find us a place to stop halfway, Charlie. Do your magic, you know, one night. Okay. Charlie wants to throw up, to scream, to confess. It takes everything to hide her confusion. You'll get all the junk food you want. Forever? <laughs> In your dreams. Miles away, dawn breaks over Boston. The thick curtains are still drawn and the door is locked with the chain in place. Sally's clothes now are neatly folded on the bed. In the dawning light, something awakens. What is it now? The noise comes from under the bed. Sally, still in her cheap motel bathrobe, kneels down warily. The object buzzes like a dying bee, the hatted stinger ripped out. Then it stops, trembling. Sally reaches under the bed. This is not my phone. Sally recognizes it. As she tries to remember who it belonged to, the phone begins vibrating again. <gasps> Hello? It's me, Sal. Karen. Kay, what's going on? How did I end up here? We planned this together, remember? I got you the credit card, the prepaid phone. You sound like I'm a fugitive or something. We planned this together to keep you safe. You don't remember? Honestly, I don't. But why? To protect you from Jay. I was worried when I didn't hear from you. Why didn't you answer? I just found the phone. I have no idea how I made it. Me neither. You were probably too high on meds. But you made it anyway, and you're safe now. Sally rolls up her sleeves. Of course, she had noticed the pricks along her arms and legs. She knows that she's been hooked on opioids for some time now, and that she's experiencing withdrawal symptoms. But something still escapes her. I did the right thing. Of course, honey. It's driving me crazy that I can't remember. It's like there's a block in my head. I can send you the history of our chats. It'll come back to you. You'll see. Look, I know it's hard, but you mustn't try to call him under any circumstances. You hear me? I hear you. Police are on his tracks. If he finds you first, He'll kill you. Getting in or taking it to go? To go. Thirteen dollars and sixty cents. I'm proud of you, Charlotte. Look, there's something I need to tell you. Well, they didn't have extra spicy sauce. Daddy, please. I'm serious. Okay, I'm sorry, kiddo. Go ahead. I'm having nightmares. Ugly ones. And it's been going on for a while. There's this man. 
I can't see his face, but I know he's evil. I can feel it. Sweetheart, we've all been pretty shaken lately. I, I can't explain it. I, I think he's a demon or something like that. He's just so real. He scares me. Sweetie, there's no such thing as demons. Whatever it is, Dad. It's chasing us. Charlie, please. You're just a bit distressed. You don't believe me, do you? Of course I do. Your nightmares are real, but demons ain't. Never mind. James wants to tell her that he understands. That the same is happening to him. But he can't. And the sad look on Charlie's face feels like a stab to his heart. Okay, I guess we better get going. The road ends in Winchester, Indiana. A place James should remember for a long time. All he wants is to find Mom. Be at peace. You're just a fucking moron, Charlie. While Charlie is locked in a silent reverie, James tries to get the coffee machine to work, but it refuses to offer such respite. An intense feeling of frustration overcomes him. I'm fucking done. Charlie, I'm going down to get a real drink at the bar. You want something? No thanks. Lock the door. The bar is filled with people, and James is uncomfortable. He knows he shouldn't be there, but he needs something to take the edge off. A shot or six of bourbon, and he'll go back to his room. And for the first time in a long while, his mind feels empty. So he lets himself go and orders a drink. He doesn't notice the woman sitting a few seats away, staring at him. Good evening. James doesn't answer, but the woman's crystalline voice is pleasant. She comes closer. Do you mind if I sit here? I was about to leave. Don't worry. I only bite if I'm asked to. James is nervous and starts playing with his wedding ring in an attempt to detract the woman. But instead, she just laughs softly. <laughs> I got a cowboy, you're married. It's all right to talk. I'm Samantha. Sorry, I'm not really in the mood to talk to strangers. Honey, we're both Earthlings, so we're no strangers. As Samantha orders another drink, James looks at her. And whatever is lurking in the pit of his stomach begins to stir. James. See? It wasn't that old. 